An artist must be free to choose what he does, certainly, but he must also never be afraid to do what he might choose. Playwright, novelist, and poet Langston Hughes was a famous man in the 1920s. His works touched on important racial aspects of his time and served as forerunners in the Harlem Renaissance movement. Today, we hope to share with you his greatness and prove that he was indeed an important man in the world of poetry. Langston Hughes was born on February 1, 1902 in Joplin, Missouri. His parents were of mixed race, but they divorced when he was young. His father had left the United States for Mexico because of his dislike of racism of black culture. When Hughes visited him, he was confused as to why his father disliked their race so much. Hughes gave an anecdotal explanation of how he got into poetry. I was a victim of a stereotype. There were only two of us Negro kids in the whole class, and our English teacher was always stressing the importance of rhythm in poetry. Well, everyone knows, except us, that all Negroes have rhythm, so they elected me class poet. I felt I couldn't let my white classmates down, and I've been writing poetry ever since. Hughes published his first poem in 1921 after he moved to Harlem, New York. As jazz was growing popular in the 1920s, he became the first writer to use jazz rhythms in his poetry. His poems commemorate urban and working class black culture in America, making him a prime leader of the Harlem Renaissance movement. Hughes quotes about the Harlem Renaissance, the Negro was in vogue. Hughes used his writing to address the social inequalities of the time. He wanted the readers of his poetry to look at race in a new light. Hughes died at the age of 65 on May 22, 1967. Langston Hughes' poems were heavily impacted by the events of the Harlem Renaissance. The Harlem Renaissance was known as the New Negro Movement, and it was a time when African American art, social life, and culture boomed. It originated in Harlem, New York between the end of World War I and the middle of the 1930s. Many African American authors and writers were exposed during the Renaissance. The movement was not meant to be political, but more aesthetic. People who participated in the movement sought to change the way people thought of the African Americans apart from all the white stereotypes. Many of the writers wrote poems, books, plays, all about new African American cultural ideas. Langston Hughes was one of the most popular poets that used the new ideas from the Renaissance to incorporate into his poems. Langston Hughes called it the expression of our individual dark-skinned selves. The instructor said, go home and write a page tonight and let that page come out of you. Then it will be true. Me, who? Well, I like to eat, sleep, drink, and be in love. I like to work, read, learn, and understand life. I like a pipe for a Christmas present, or records, Bessie, Bop, or Bach. I guess being colored doesn't make me not like the same things other folks like who are other races. So will my page be colored that I write? Being me, it will not be white, but it will be a part of you, instructor. You are white yet a part of me as I am a part of you. That's American. Sometimes, perhaps, you don't want to be a part of me, nor do I often want to be a part of you. But we are. That's true. As I learn from you, I guess you learn from me, although you're older and white and somewhat more free. This is my page for English B. The speaker of theme for English B is a black student writing an assignment for his white professor. The assignment appears to be to write a page that comes out of yourself and then it will be true. The speaker begins to question the assignment. Is what is true for him true for his white professor? Hughes uses this poem to drop facts about his life. The tidbits he shares are exceedingly average, making him appear to be a normal 22-year-old college student. Hughes then poses the question, why would me being colored make me not like the same thing as non-colored people? This gives the whole poem an ironic tone, attacking racism from a more sarcastic angle and ending the poem with calling out his professor as somewhat more free. White workers of the South, miners, farmers, mechanics, mill hands, shop girls, railway men, servants, tobacco workers, sharecroppers, greetings. I am the black worker, listen. 
that the land might be ours and the mines and the factories and the office towers at Harlan, Richmond, Gastonia, Atlanta, New Orleans, that the plants and the roads and the tools of power be ours. Let us forget what Booker T said, separate as the fingers. Let us become instead you and I, one single hand that can unite and rise to smash the old dogmas of the past, kill the lies of color that keep the rich enthroned, and drive us to the time clock and the plow, helpless, stupid, scattered, and alone as now. Race against race, because one is black, another white of face. White worker, here is my hand. Today, we're man to man. Langston Hughes' open letter to the South is about black workers coming together to work with white workers in America. The message that is conveyed in this poem is if everyone came and worked together as one big team, America would be much more successful. The poem speaks to the audience that everyone must forget the pains and miseries from the past that involved terrible inequality and racism. The poem says everyone must join hands and forget the discrimination or else America will not work successfully. The, the tone of this poem is optimistic and positive. The poem's tempo seems skippy, like this plan must take place and all will be happy. Through Hugh's use of a skippy tempo, it makes the poem all that more convincing and, and persuasive to the audience. Hughes exclaims on lines two and three in stanza three, let us forget what Booker T said, separate as the fingers. Booker T. Washington once said, in all things social, we can be as separate as the fingers, yet one as the hand in all things essential to mutual success. Hughes is trying to let, tell his audience that we should give up on the idea that we are all separate from each other like fingers on a hand, and we should focus on the last part of Washington's quote. Hughes wants America to stand together as one, like a full hand, so that we will all have greater mutual success and progress in our country. Hughes expresses the urgency of this poem by using frequent exclamation points, which makes the poem seem like more of a powerful speech than a letter. The third stanza is a very important poem as it holds both negative and positive connotation. He starts by using positive connotation to describe how the two sides are together and that they can smash the dogmas of the past to kill the lies of color. Within that positive sounding line, Hughes uses strong words such as smash and, and kill to show the strength and power the two would have if they were together. The negativity comes to play when he writes, helpless, stupid, scattered, and alone, to show that they are divided. There is a bit of alliteration going on with the letter S to put even more emphasis on these words. Ultimately, the mean of this poem reveals that there is a desire to weld together the social divide between African Americans and whites. In today's world, our country has been much more successful with everyone working together. However, people do still have a problem with working with people of different races, but most people have realized that the only way for America to truly be successful and progressive is if we join together as one. You and your whole race, look down upon the town in which you live and be ashamed. Look down upon white folks and upon yourselves and be ashamed that such supine poverty exists there, that such stupid ignorance breeds children there, behind such humble shelters of despair, that you yourselves have not the sense to care, nor the manhood to stand up and say, I dare you to come one step nearer, evil world, with your hands of greed seeking to touch my throat, I dare you to come one step nearer me, when you can say that you will be free. Hughes' You and Your Whole Race is about the narrator shaming a race of people and portrays Hughes' feelings about African-American shortcomings in American society. Hughes uses many negative words in this poem to create a tone of disapproval. Hughes blames whites in society for the supine poverty and stupid ignorance that is present. Whites hold the power in the society, and they seem to be openly manipulating and controlling the African-American population. Hughes claims that the African-Americans have not the sense to care, nor the manhood to stand up and say anything against this injustice. African Americans don't even have homes to live in, and said they possess humble shelters of despair, adding to the gloomy attitude of the peace. Hughes also commonly connects you and ashamed throughout the first part of the stanza. He seems to blame the African Americans directly for the problems he explains further in the poem, saying be ashamed twice in lines 3 and 6. 
This connection works towards the idea that African Americans are in a terrible, posi terrible position as a result of their own actions and choices. Hughes also challenges the African American population towards the end of the poem. He dares them to touch my throat, come one step nearer me. Hughes knows that African Americans possess the power to make a change, they just need a push to make it happen. The last two lines of the stanza are also separated from the rest, having several indentations. Hughes wants to make this an interjection in the poem, the part that stands out from all the rest. He wants African Americans to know that this is the way in which they can fix the society, by standing up to the present inequality. Hughes seems to have complex relations with the America of his time. He clearly sees the injustices that are present, but he also sees the solutions that people can take to fix them. Hughes believes that America could be free of racial prejudice, but that it is up to the people to make the dream become a reality.